I hope that everyone is having a great day or afternoon, wherever or whenever you're watching this. Today, we're going to be talking about three steps that are going to be giving you consistent contacts in agility. I'm Caitlin, a One Mind Dogs coach located in South Carolina, and One Mind Dogs has really changed how I look at agility and dogs in general. It really helped me to see things from a clear standpoint because it's all from the dog's perspective. We try to focus on things that are natural for the dogs and therefore we get to focus on less repetitions and get to really get down to the nitty-gritty fun of agility which is getting to put things together and really see the joy in the dog's eyes when it comes to things like contacts i noticed that there are three things that really make a difference in if we have consistent contacts or if we kind of manage it and babysit those contacts. So if you find that you or your students' contacts have slowly turned into lava, then this is going to be something you're gonna to wanna to stick around for. So here are my three things that I notice pop up a lot, and we are going to go into detail on each of these. So the first one is a given, but you'd be surprised how many people don't really think about it. The first one is a clear criteria. The second one is how well have you actually proofed that criteria in a lot of different settings? And the third one is, are you actually giving the dog variable reinforcement when it times comes time to test it. Easy for me to say. <laughs> so these are our three topics that we are going to be talking in depth about this morning or wherever you're watching this from. And I hope that this gives you a little bit of insight into your contacts if you're having trouble. Now, the first thing that we really want to talk about when we're talking about a clear criteria is what are your expectations when your dog is getting into that yellow zone? And I want you to create this picture in your head of what that looks like. How are they moving? What are their feet doing? What are their head doing? How are they getting into that position? And this is true for if you're going to be doing a stopped contact or a running contact, you want to have as clear of a picture in your head as to what that criteria is before you even get started in your training. The clearer your picture in your head is, the easier it's going to be for you to know when you're in the right direction with your dog. Now, in agility, there are quite a few different contact types that you could be thinking about, but we're gonna talk for a moment about our stopped contacts versus our running contacts because there are a lot of great things about both of them. And I think there's also some myths related to stopped versus running. So I have this graphic to kind of show. Uh, on the left, we have a stopped contact in a two on two off position. Once again, there are a few different variations of stopped contacts, but the most popular are going to be two on two off. And then on the right, we have some of that beautiful extension, also known as a running contact. When it comes to the two of these, there are definitely a lot of thoughts that come up, but one of the main things is that both of these require training. You will not get either of these criteria for free or by hoping that your dog just happens to hit the contact zone. So both of these are going to require some training, but there's a couple of things that you can think about when you're deciding for a moment which kind of contact criteria you're going to do with your dog. In a two on two off, this is something that is very easy to teach with no equipment required at all. I've had a couple of dogs that we taught completely away from the contact equipment and it only took a single session of adding it to an actual contact for them to understand the criteria. A two on two off also uh, insinuates that the dog is running to the end and stopping until the handler has released them, which does give a lot of handlers more options for easier handling after the contact. It lets you have a moment to catch up or get further ahead depending on the course. So if you're someone who has more limited movement, two on two off is a really good option to give you a little bit of an advantage in your handling strategy. The two on two off is also easy to maintain with minimal training. You go back a little bit and reinforce it a bit over time, but it's relatively easy to maintain. And the one downside is that it does cause the dog to slow down on the course where they're getting to the end and they do stop for a moment. And depending on how long it takes 
before you release them, that can add some time to your overall time. However, if you're a handler that you're not as worried about the time as making sure you're in the next good position, a two-on-two -two off is a good option. However, scooching over to the running contacts, uh, the running contacts, once you have a understanding of the very foundation of it, it does actually require access to actual equipment on a pretty steady basis. So if you're not somebody that has access to equipment uh, on a very regular basis, maybe a running contact's not a great option for you. But if you do have access to contact equipment on a very regular basis, then you're still there. Um, but it also does require some dog training knowledge um, that's required to capture the behavior. And you also have to develop your eye. How do you know when they have a good hit versus when they don't? You can very easily kind of fall into what we call a gray area when you're training something like a running contact if you don't quite have the eye for it. So running contacts are great for if you already understand some basics of dog training and you have a bit of an eye when it comes to how the dogs are striving into those contacts. It does take a bit more repetitions to maintain. However, what you benefit are the dogs gaining speed through the entire performance. So there isn't any delay when they get to the end, they just continue to run straight through. That could be a benefit if you're somebody who's looking to have those top times. However, that could also be a downside if you're a handler with limited mobility and would really like a moment to catch up. So two on two off, I always suggest for those of us that have more novice experience. Uh, we don't quite know what we're getting into yet. It's always great to kind of have that very clear understanding. And then once you have a good idea of what you're getting into, running contacts can be a great option if you have access to the actual contact equipment. So there's the two differences between our two on two off versus our running contact. I have dogs that have each, but it's really good to kind of get a picture in your head about what each one looks like. So when it comes to our actual contact criteria, what happens over time is sometimes we get into that gray area that I mentioned earlier, and that comes into making things very unclear for the dog. Uh, when they are getting into a contact, sometimes handlers will get into a, uh, they were close enough and therefore they release them or they reward it. And that creates that moment of the dog being like, okay, so that was acceptable and this was also acceptable. So what exactly is it that you're looking for when your dog is getting into that yellow zone? When the dogs become unsure, they start to do things like creep very slowly down into the yellow zone. They might avoid the contact altogether or do one of those flying leaps <laughs> off of the zone just before the yellow. I've had people tell me about those quite frequently. Or the dogs will stop at the very top and sightsee, which is also another form of avoidance behavior. If you're noticing any of those steps in your dog, they're creeping down into the yellow zone, they're hanging out at the top, or they're just avoiding it altogether, you may have created some unclear expectations for your dog as they are approaching that contact zone. The dogs just want to be right. So the more clear you can be in your rewarding for your criteria, the better off your consistency will be. So if I'm looking for, for example, a two on two off criteria with my dog, I do not want to reward them when they get down to the end, but they still have all four feet on the contact board. I want to wait to release them or reward them until I actually see front feet on the ground, back feet on the board. Similar goes for running contacts. If I'm doing a running contact, I want to see feet in a specific place. So let's say I wanna see my dog's back feet in the second half of the yellow zone, and they happen to stride on the top half of it with just a toenail. They were technically in, but if I were to reward that moment in time, I'm now creating a gray area for what is acceptable for the dog and what is not. So something to think about if you notice that your dog is doing any of these behaviors. Now, when you are thinking about creating your contact criteria, you want to think about that expectation. What is acceptable when they approach that contact zone? And you want to try to be as specific as you can. 
How should they move? Where should the feet hit? How many feet should hit? Where should they be looking? How long should they be there? So when I'm thinking about my two on two off with my dogs, I'm thinking that I want them to drive full speed down all the way until front feet are hitting the ground and I want their head to be low as they get into that position before they look at me. Anything beside that performance, I am going to not be as happy with and I'm going to ask them to either do it again or I'm going to go back to some proofing stages, which we'll be getting to in a moment. But I want to have my full clear criteria in my head before I even start training. And then every training session that I go into in the future, I want to have that clear criteria in my head. What does it look like? So that's true for your running contacts as well. Which feet are going to be acceptable for you and which feet need to be where in that contact zone? Just hitting vaguely in the contact zone is not clear enough because if you watch the dogs that have that kind of a criteria, you'll see that they change it every single time. And before you know it, they're striding over that yellow zone completely. So I like to not only think about where they're hitting, but with what feet and how. Makes a very big difference to your contact criteria in the long run. Now, it is possible for you to have a different criteria for each piece of contact equipment. In agility, we have a dog walk, an A-frame, and a teeter-totter. And in each of those pieces of equipment, they look different enough that you could actually have a different type of criteria for each. The important thing is that you have consistency between each of the contacts. So for example, you can have a stopped A-frame and a running dog walk, you could have a running dog walk and a running A-frame with a stop teeter. You can have any type of intermix in there. But make sure that each of your contacts, you have a very clear criteria as to what you're going to accept and when. What should they expect as they're approaching that contact? Should they be stopping? Should they be running? And if you don't get that, you're going to want to be fixing it. So in this case, I'm going to show you an example of mixed criteria in um, contacts. So go up here. This is my little yokai. She has a stopped A-frame. This is Valor doing his stopped A-frame. And then Titanium doing her running A-frame. So for titanium, she has a running A-frame and a stopped teeter and a stopped dog walk. So she ran her A-frame. Here's her pause for her teeter. Here's her thinking about her weaves. She really loves her weaves. And then here is her stopped dog walk. Now she's still getting experience in the ring, so not everything is perfect there, but um, there she showed very clear understanding of when I was looking for a running criteria and when I was looking for a stopped criteria. So you can intermix them. I tend to not intermix them between the same exact contact. That's a different story, but you can. You just want to make sure that your dog understands what exactly you're looking for the moment that they are getting into that performance. So as their feet are hitting that up plank of whatever contact Contact, they should know what is expected as they get to the end. If you're not sure what you're expecting, then they won't be sure either. So keep it as clear as you possibly can, but you can intermix them. Just keep it clear in your head. The teeter is kind of in a league of its own because there are a few different performances that you can look for in the teeter. And the main thing that I think about when I come to a teeter is I not only want to think about how my dog is doing the teeter, I want to think about how they react to the different types of things that are related to the teeter. So when it comes to teaching the teeter, there are three things that I think about. I have my sound, I have my movement, and I have my height. I want my dog to be comfortable with all of those, and I want to think about where their slowdown moment is. A lot of times when I ask a handler, where does their dog decelerate on their teeter, they say, I don't know, or what do you mean? <laughs> what are you referring to? 
And what I'm referring to is where does your dog think the pivot point is? So when it comes to a teeter, what I want to see from all of my dogs is run until there is no more board and then slow down. Depending on the size of the dog, they will then rock back and ride it down or they'll continue into that two on two off position because the board will be hitting the ground just then but I wanna be thinking about what exactly are they doing in those moments they're getting across the teeter and riding it down. I wanna know where my dog is anticipating. Um, I have students that they will watch their dogs and not have any clue where their dog is slowing down. One of the dogs, if she were to run all the way through to the edge and ride it down, a little dog, she would ride it down, let it hit and have a beautiful performance. But if her handler watched her and she decelerated just before the contact zone and rode it down there, she would hop off the side every single time. So she could kind of have an idea of how confident her dog was feeling and what to expect in that moment to fix it and catch it in that moment before it even happened. So I'm going to show you some video of some different dogs doing the teeter because I think that's a very cool thing. <laughs> and here is a mix of big dogs and also crowd favorite as Jan doing the teeter as well. And once again, my criteria is that I want the dogs to move all the way through to the end until there is no more board and then decelerate. I don't want to see any deceleration at the actual pivot point. That's my personal criteria. It does not have to be your personal criteria, but be as specific as you can when you are coming up with a criteria for each contact equipment. All right, here is our teeter. So you can see here, these dogs are very confident with the teeter moving all the way through that pivot point to the end and riding it down. That's the kind of criteria that I try to strive for with my dogs as well. And if they decelerate before that moment, I'm gonna ask them to do it again. Or I might go back to a training step if they're uncomfortable. So here's little Ezion. He, we were working some send forward. He runs all the way to the end. He did that little pull back, so I came in and reinforced him through. Here he is at Sinosport. I had to remind him of his stop, but once again, <laughs> running all the way to the end and riding it down. That is what I want to see all the way to the end. In this next clip, you'll see Titanium, and she decelerated before I wanted her to, so it was not my criteria, so I had her do that spot again. I want her to move through that pivot point. So this next time, she drove way better to the end, and therefore, I stepped in and reinforced that criteria. But keeping that criteria clear in your head is going to also keep it clear for your dog as you're training it. All right, now comes the proofing. And I feel like when it comes to proofing, this is the one thing that most people just kind of glaze over in the training. Like, okay, we finally have it consistent in this spot. Let's just take it right to trial. Ah, put on the brakes. We first have to proof that our dogs understand what we want to. And when it comes to proofing, I love the saying, get comfortable with being uncomfortable you need to prove things that you wouldn't normally do or you think that you wouldn't normally do because we as humans get into patterns and in those patterns we try to do the same exact thing every single time and in competition we don't get to decide where the course goes normally so we have to prove for things that we wouldn't expect so what we have to try to think about is what are the habits that we are doing that we don't even realize that we're doing and then we have to kind of break the pattern so one of the most common things that i notice is that people stop or slow down as the dog reaches the yellow zone and so how you can fix this proof running by continue moving and once again these proofing steps are true for stopped contacts and running contacts i've seen this for both so 
we tend to help the dog finish running to the end or we stay close to the contact. I've seen a lot of like running to the end and pointing to the spot we want them to take. Um, and then we wait for the dog to get into our criteria before we do a handling like a front cross or a blind cross and then we release them. All of these things are things that we do as habits to help the dog succeed. But when we are trying to help the dog succeed, we are actually making it harder for them to succeed in the future. So we want to prove all of these things. We want to prove running by the contact. We want to prove hanging back so they can send forward without us. So that's common in distance challenges. We want to prove lateral distance and we want to practice finishing multiple handling techniques while they get into position. So I'm going to pull up this video about some proofing steps that we can be doing uh, with our dogs as we're going through. So here we're going to be proofing something that's exciting to a lot of dogs, which is their reward being ahead. This could be the next obstacle or um, you being ahead, but just having something exciting that they want to get to, but they still have to do their criteria to gain access is a great proofing step. So here you can see it kind of messed her up for a moment there where she was like, I want to go. Always help the dog be successful. So in this case, we could see the dog was anticipating. So we've put the dog on a leash to help the dog make that right choice before being released into the contact. Here is an example of what I was talking about. Um, doing the handling while the dog is getting into position rather than letting the dog be in position and then do the handling. So you want the dog to see you doing those blind crosses and doing those front crosses while they are still getting into position because that is realistic to when you're actually running your courses. In training, it's so easy to stop beside the dog and do your handling, but in your actual competition, you're in a hurry. You're not going to be thinking about that stopping and continuing moving through. So you want to be thinking about that as you're, you're working through realistic proofing, but think about all the different things that you can do. You can proof your running by, but rather than starting at a run, start at a small walk, start at a jog, start at then sprint and, and so on and so on. Work just the end, work your way back. <clears throat> You want to keep your proofing as bite-sized as possible so that the dog can succeed. You want to proof stuff, but you also don't want the dog to have too many failures. If they've had a mistake, that's just information to you that they didn't quite have that information at the time. So we're not necessarily looking for them to fail, but we are looking to see where their limit is. So if we have a fail, we are gonna take it back a few steps so then we can help them be successful. So here's our examples of running by our contact. I'm gonna walk slowly by, I'm gonna speed walk by, then I'm gonna jog, then maybe I'm gonna slow run, and then I'm gonna try that full sprint. When it comes to doing techniques at the end of my contact, I want to start off with techniques that allow me to keep connection with the dog. So I'm going to do a front cross. I'm going to do a running on the dog's line. Things that let me kind of inadvertently add that pressure to the dog to help them succeed when they're starting. And if they nail those, then I'm going to move on to those techniques that I technically disconnect from the dog for a moment. Things like a blind cross or a reverse spin. Things that I'm going to take my eyes off of the dog and it's going to be really Really exciting for them for a moment and they think oh, I have to catch up but wait I still have to hit my contact criteria these get a little bit more tricky when you are training a running contact in the stopped contacts it's very clear either they came with you or they're still on the end of the contact when you're done if you have a running contact and you're proofing this I highly suggest either having a clicker mat or somebody that can tell you yes they hit or ooh, that wasn't a good one so you can be clear there um, but same with the techniques, start slow, add speed as you go. Then you want to start taking your proofing show on the road. So if you feel like you've proofed everything you can in your area, then you want to try to proof it in new environments. Try a different class with different dogs. Try a run through. You want to go somewhere new. 
that has new equipment. You could go to visit a friend's uh, field, a friend's yard, a friend's facility, a new facility. You could NFC at a trial. When we are doing this stage, we're once again looking to proof and test the dog's understanding. We are not looking to make them fail. Keep in mind, this part, we've still been doing a lot of rewarding. So we want to do this in a way that we can still reward and give them clear information if they get it wrong. I want to take this moment to show you a great video about um, proofing natural distractions because I think it's something that a lot of us forget about. We kind of get into these crazy distractions and we forget about proofing the natural distractions. In the end, so like you, you would handle the, the tunnel, but don't give a release command. <laughs> And if the dog stays there, go to reward. Stop! Natural distraction. You are not running like that normally. That was more natural. First looking the dog and then turning your look towards the tunnel. Then make a front cross and no release command. Okay, you can continue one more time. And distractions. And front cross. So sorry if you can hear the howl fest going on in my house. Very excited dogs. <laughs> All right, so you can see that in those moments you have that. Oh my goodness, they are very excited puppies. Um, but you can see in that moment that the natural distractions got the dog every time that looking at the dog in the eyes and then taking a step forward got the dog to release almost every time without the release word. So when it comes to doing your proofing and your distractions, think about adding in things that are natural for the dog, things that you would naturally do. Just connect with them. That can tend to get them uh, on your start line stays as well. Connect with them and do a movement proof that understanding of what they're doing, but proof realistic things. The more realistic you proof, the easier it is for the dog. They can tell when we're doing all these crazy things versus when we are actually in a competition and doing something real that'll get them every single time. So that's a really easy adjustment you can do to your training. The last thing, so this is after I have given myself a super clear criteria after I have proofed as much as I can possibly think of with my realistic proofing, with my realistic movement, with my different places and everything, now I'm going to move into my variable reinforcement. So this means I am not rewarding my criteria every single time. <clears throat> so how often should I be rewarding? When I'm first starting with my dogs and their criteria, I reward 100% of the time. Every single time we have success, I'm rewarding, I'm rewarding a lot, and I'm doing it consistently. When I get to my proofing phase, so I feel like they have a good idea of what they're doing and I'm trying to test their understanding a little bit, I'm going to go down to 50% of the time. If I'm proofing something brand new in a brand new area, I'm going to go back up to my 100%, but if I'm proofing in my usual zone, just something new that I think they can handle, I'm going to reward 50% of the time. When I'm getting ready to compete for the first time, I want to make sure that my reward amount is down to 40% or less of the time. 
And then when I'm competing, I'm going to be rewarding as often as I do other obstacles. And I think this tends to be one of the things that gets people into some trouble when they're going into the ring for the first time. The dogs get ring savvy. They know when they're in the ring, they are never getting the reward. At least now sometimes they can, but <laughs> they were never getting the reward in competition. But in training, I always get the reward. So they see that it's different and they become ring savvy and know that if they miss it in this environment, very rarely do I do anything about it. Very rarely do they even get the opportunity to reward. So I want my competition environment to be as similar to my training environment as I can. So I'm going to be rewarding when they're at this level less in my training to help them understand. So I want to reward it as often as I do my tunnels or my jumps or my weaves. So if I'm doing something really hard and they're successful, I'm going to reward that. But I'm not going to reward every single contact they do in training just because they were successful. That's how I get that, that kind of an issue. <clears throat> So if you notice you're having some trouble when you go into competition, ask yourself, how often am I rewarding in training for this criteria still? And just taking back your reward in training to a, a less percentage, you'll see a difference in the dogs. Now, this is also related to going into the competition ring. This is holding your dog accountable. And this is also holding yourself accountable. So I love this photo of me with titanium. I'm having a pep talk with her and she already has in her head, I am going to go and do this. So I have to know when I'm stepping into the ring, what kind of mindset my dog is going to do. And I need to be ready to hold them accountable just like I would in training. So if, if I have gotten to the point where I am rewarding less in my training and I am going into the ring with that less reward, I have to still make sure that my competition looks as much like training as possible. So if they miss that contact, I'm fixing it. I'm going to have them pop back on it or I'm going to do the full contact again, depending on the dog and the situation. I am not letting them continue forward with a missed criteria, period. If they have a broken start line, it's exactly the same. I'm not letting them continue forward if they are breaking their start line. If you watch Stephanie's uh, webinar on start line stays, you kind of get that idea. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's great. Um, but same thing goes for other things in the course. If they didn't read Ascend, I'm not just going to go past that part. I'm going to retry that part for training things. So this is going to help my dog understand that all these environments are the same. Whether I'm in training or I'm in competition, the feeling, the energy, how I do it is exactly the same. You miss it here, we go back and we fix it. You miss it here, we go back and we fix it. There's even been competition runs that my dog, my young dogs have had trouble. They've nailed something and I've left the ring to go reward that something really fast to make it a, a point that, wow, that was amazing because that's what I would have done in my training as well. And that keeps it super clear. And I know it's hard <laughs> to throw away a run or something, but you always want to look at it as I fix this now or I fight missed lava contacts for the rest of their career. I manage it and I make my agility not as fun anymore. Keep it clear and it keeps it easy for the dogs to stay. So if you have a running contact, look for that same criteria in your competition. If you have a stopped contact, look for that same criteria in competition. I cannot tell you the number of students I have that suddenly have running contacts when they step into the ring when they didn't a few days earlier. And then they wonder why they're missing their contacts after a few trials. Holds the dogs accountable just like you would hold yourself accountable. That also keeps them not stressed. They know what to expect when they're going up to certain equipment and they know what's going to happen when certain things happen. Be fair to your dog. 
we can't blame the dog when things go wrong because they don't do things wrong on purpose. If something happens to happen, it's usually because of something on this list. You either didn't train it correctly, so you didn't add in all of your steps so they don't actually have the understanding you think they do. You haven't proofed that yet. So uh, I've done all this proofing, but I didn't proof what would happen when my dog was really, really high feeling and now I've missed that. Or maybe, my dog is just having a bad day. <laughs> um, but you have to be thinking about why your dog is doing things. They try to do things that benefit them and doing something wrong that upsets you does not benefit them. They're only doing things to the best of their current understanding. So when something happens, ask yourself, what have I done in my training that makes them think that that is the answer? And I can always refer back to how did I train it? How did I proof it? And did I take my proofing elsewhere and set them up for success? <clears throat> you always want to make sure that you have that clear criteria, that you're fair in your proofing, and then you do your variable reward so they know the expectations when they come to those situations. You want to try to set your dog up for success and try not to put your dog in a situation of something they're not prepared for. So if you haven't moved on to your variable reinforcement yet, I wouldn't try to not reward at all in your competition. I would maybe do an NFC run in your competition and reward those contacts still so they see it's the same. That's an example of setting them up for success and not something they're not prepared for. So with all of that said, these are your three steps to your consistent contacts and agility. And if you notice, they are all related to you as the handler having a clear mind when it comes to those contacts. You wanna have a clear criteria. Which feet, where, for how long, or until when? Am I releasing them? Are they supposed to pounce and go? What does that criteria look like? Have that clear picture in your head before you even start your training. Then you add on to your proofing. Can I run by? Can I send them forward? Can I do lateral distance? Can I do handling before and after that contact and have that same criteria I had previously? And then I'm gonna be moving into my variable rewards. Maybe I'm gonna do a pre-place reward. Maybe I'm gonna reward after five repetitions this time. Maybe I'm gonna reward after another obstacle so they understand it's not exactly the same every single time. Re do your contact, get rewarded. Do your contact, get rewarded. It's gonna look different as they go through. So have those steps ready so you can always go back. Okay, now I've moved into my variable reward, but my dog just had trouble well, did I proof this step as I was doing it? When I'm in my proofing step, uh, is my criteria as clear as it could be? Or do I need to kind of think harder about what my criteria is? Your criteria could be anything, but have it clear in your head. What should be happening when the dogs get into those positions? The more clear you are from the start, the more consistent your contact performance will be. Keep it clear, keep it concise, keep it fun. As you're training, if the dog becomes unsure, then go back a step. Keep it fun for them and it will be fun for you as you're moving through. And that's kind of <laughs> part of our ideas with One Mind Dogs is that it's all about the dog. We want to keep things exciting and fun and um, look at things from the dog's point of view. If they do something, there's always a reason. And the reason is normally related to them either not having a strong understanding of something or something that we just haven't even introduced to them yet. But looking at it from their perspective, everything becomes a lot more clear as we go through. So we will have some, um, we'll have the ebook available for everyone who was here at the webinar so that you can um, take a look at our methodology if you're not already a One Mind Dogs member. But what you want to be thinking about is <laughs> looking at things from the dog's perspective and the dog's point of view. Um, also make sure that you are signed up to get the emails because the follow-up emails I'm going to be answering some of the common questions that we had throughout the webinar so that we can 
take a look at at um, those in a bit of a deeper dive and also give you some links that we see in the website, which is super awesome. All right, I hope that you all have a great rest of your day.